Well, students, this is Henrietta Newton Martin with you. I wish I could really put on my video, but today I'm not able to put it on for a particular purpose because, as I told you earlier, like evenings is kind of difficult for me, but I'm trying to juggle between some other thing as well. So that's the reason today my video will not be on. Well, uh, just for your benefit and for your, um, you know, for your convenience. And so that maximum number of students take benefit of this lecture. So that's a reason, uh, like somehow I agreed for having a class at this time. Well, now the first thing that I want you to understand, I hope I'm audible. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes, Thank we you. hear you. Yeah. Thanks, Rashid. Uh, well, so I was talking yes, about... Yes. yes, thanks. Thanks, uh, Abdullahi. Okay. So, um, okay, so what I was saying, oh yeah, I was talking about, there are certain rules for this class, okay. One minute, there is another student is trying to enter. I think it's, okay, he's gone out, fine. So yeah, there are some rules for this class. The first rule is that attendance is important. This is just the introduction class. We are meeting for the first time, so I prefer to, you know, tell what are the rules for this class and how you can really benefit uh, your best from this lecture. So it is actually a two way, uh, you know, cooperation. There should be cooperation from your end as well, of course, and I'll be cooperating as well. So first thing is attendance is a must. Why? You know that attendance carries marks. Why they are asking, or why have they set up this criteria as attendance and that it should be carrying marks? The reason is that you get an opportunity also to earn marks, one. And two, it is a kind of an assessment that we are going to make for this class uh, with respect to student interaction, I might ask any questions and how the student is responding in the class. Who is the student? What's the name of the student? How the student is performing in the class? So I'm going to assess these factors. And uh, you know, I'm going to keep this in mind as well for your internal assessment so that we could finally, you know, at the end, add it to your final marks. So that is the reason we are saying that attendance is compulsory. That's one thing. Second is, uh, I don't mind you write any name and you, you know, in, on this, in this meeting list and you come with even names such as Samsung or, you know, just even with your pet names, I really don't mind that. However, for sake of attendance, um, I want you to just add your names in the message. As soon as you enter the class, just put your name. I'm sure that's not going to be much of a hassle and I don't think it's going to be tough for you. Okay. So this is one thing. So, the next part of it is um, assignment is already posted, okay? So the assignment that is given to you is something practical in nature. And of course, you're going to need theoretical base for that. You'll have to understand what is international law and diplomacy and what is the role of diplomacy, you know, how diplomacy plays a role in case of wars. And I want you to talk about the prevalent war that is there or the present war that's going on uh, that is between Ukraine and Russia. So you will have to work hard on that. And of course, minimum words is 2000, <clears throat> sorry. And the other criteria, whatever is there is already explained there. On-time submission is, you know, really encouraged. I would really encourage all of you to gain maximum marks so that, you know, see, I'm a person who will normally award marks justifiably. I do justice to my students and I want you to help me with that. I want you to, you know, submit your assignments on time. Like there is a date that is fixed there. That is, I guess it's the third or the fourth of October. Just go through your Google classroom and check it. And you have to give it to me on that particular date. And uh, anything that is submitted beyond that would be subject to minus one mark, that is deduction. Next is don't give me assignments with cut, copy, paste, or directly which is copied from elsewhere or from some you know internet or some articles. But I, I because I would check for you know plagiarism, and uh, you know so in case the higher the level or the higher the percentage of plagiarism. So you're, there's going to be deduction of marks to that extent. And of course, I've already put a note there, like 
to what extent the marks would be deducted. So that is with respect to your assignment. So we have spoken about attendance. We have spoken about writing your names as soon as you enter the class in the chat box. And the third thing is I've spoken about your assignments. Now we'll move further and we'll discuss the subject. Today is just an introductory class, okay? However, we are going to deal with the first chapter. Of course, it's an introduction chapter. The first chapter, what we're going to deal with today is international law and diplomacy, of course, an introduction to that. I understand you're international law students and you already know what is international law, right? And now, of course, probably you are stuck up with what is diplomacy. Now, international law and diplomacy. What is international law? Can someone tell me? Can someone answer me? What is international law? Have you studied the subject before? Okay. What is international what law? Is it? The name itself suggests international law. That means it is not domestic law. Let's make it very simple. Okay. I do not want you to think big things. I want you to understand things first small. Understand? We have to go from the basics to the higher level. So first we need to understand the basics and things which are simply understood certainly will help you to understand great matters. If you look at the word or the term international law, you see the word international. If someone asks you what is international law, you're international law student, we are not expecting you to give me an exact definition of what it is. You see the word international, you could say that it is a law that is established at the international level. It is used by the nations. It is recognized by the nations across the globe and it binds the nations together in their relationship. It's a simple definition. You could just say it in your own words. Or you could simply say that international law is a set of rules and principles which basically governs the relationship between the nations by its international law, as well as it governs the relationship between the states and international law we refer to as country to a country as a state so between states and individuals it could be a country and in the country it could be a an organization so that organization representing the country could be called as a state so it is a relationship between the states and the individuals and relationship between international organizations i'm repeating again i believe your international law students you should be you should be knowing this definition just by heart in the sense, in your own words, what is international law? International law is nothing but. Can you repeat? Can someone tell me what is international law? Now, I think I should pick up someone. Uh, Farah, Farah, can you tell me what's international law? Fast, okay. Farah, can you tell me what is international law? Yes, uh, madam. Yes, please. Yes, Ado, tell me. Yeah, this uh, set of rules and regulations that govern between nations and countries. Very good. Very good, Ado. I am really going to make a note of your name. Thank you so much. And uh, you was, what's your entire name? What's your full name? Um, Abdi Ado Ahmed. Ahmed, Ado Ahmed. Uh, Abdi, Abdi Ado, Abdi Ado. Abdi Ado. Okay, Abdi Ado Ahmed. Thank you. Very good answer. Yes. See, you are giving me a very simple answer. It's not complicated. If someone asks you what's international law, just as Ado said, he just says that it is a set of rules, you know, at the international level between nations. That's all. So again, I'm going to go further. When we are talking about international law, there are three things we have to remember. Okay, one, it is a set of rules. Why are we saying it is a set of rules? I'll tell you the reason. If you look at laws inside your own country, who makes the laws in your country? 
can you tell me who makes laws in a country yes uh, parliamentarian are the lawmakers very good so parliament is a law making body that is a legislature so the legislature legislates legislature legislates laws within the territory of the country or when it is divided into internal states you might have a state law within the country and you might have a national law or the federal law right so who makes laws it is a legislature legislature legislates legislature promulgates laws that's one thing now the question comes here who makes international law so you now you know how laws are made so then what is international law so that's what you're going to learn now international law there are a set of rules and principles now they have their source in treaties they have their source in conventions they have their source they they take it from you know the prevalent customs which are there so they have their source in certain agreements between the nations so it is not necessarily laws that are widely promulgated or legislated but they are set of rules and principles which basically govern the relationship between the nations between two nations or more nations or between the countries and also between countries and even with particular individuals individuals can be whom even for example companies it could be between one country and another country it can be between one country and an individual or a company or a corporate sector it could be between two international organizations so the 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 jurisdiction of international law is of course the nations and it is widely used and it basically consists of rules and principles where it has its source in treaties and conventions it has its source in customs it has its source in certain general principles of law which are widely you know accepted by the world committee or it is accepted globally now you are going to basically learn in this class international law and diplomacy so the question is what is diplomacy i'm sure you've heard of diplomatics you or a diplomat you would have, i'm sorry you must have heard the word diplomat he is a diplomat he is a diplomat who's you know from this particular country or there is a meeting of diplomats who are these diplomats diplomats are all high the people of you know certain professionals of higher rank who are representing the nations or representing their particular country in a dialogue that they may want to have with another country so that means what is diplomatic law or what is diplomacy what is diplomacy then diplomacy is nothing but it is a practice by whom by these diplomats what do they do in 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 the pursuit of diplomacy what do they do it is a social practice where they represent any nation and they interact with some other nation or some other country for whatever subject it may be it could be with respect to a conflict it could be with respect to any war like situation it could be with respect to commerce it could be with respect to trade it could be just you know regarding any relationship that they want to really expand they want to have a friendly relationship with each other or they want to solve a particular border dispute probably so who represents it? there there are certain diplomats which who represent the country and they normally you know they represent the country and they would move forward and try to solve these problems using certain internationally known principles and within the ambit of international law so therefore we say that international law and diplomacy are siblings or they are like brothers and sisters or you could say they are siblings or you could say that they are two sisters why because they are interconnected without diplomacy i don't think international law would have developed i don't think so are you understanding without diplomacy see i i this is just a general lecture i'm just trying to explain to you there is no screen at the moment there is no screen at the moment okay i'm going to come up with the powerpoint presentation shortly you just have to have a little bit of patience so 
we were talking about diplomacy. I know it's a little bit boring to stare at a blank screen like this. Normally, all my classes, my video is on. But uh, normally, all the classes, my video is on. But for this class, unfortunately, as I said, it's an evening class. And for me, like evening, I, I, I'm, I'm excessively busy. My diary is excessively full. So probably I will try for the next class or oh, understand what's going on in your mind. Probably you're not able to really, you know, relate with me. But still, I want you to be all ears. Lend me your ears for now and quit being distracted. Okay, welcome. So we were talking about diplomacy. If you have any questions pertaining to the subject, if you don't understand anything, you can just raise up your hand, raise your hand. And at the right time, I will come back to you. And then I will, you know, you, you, then I'll give you an opportunity to express your concern and then we will sort it out. So do you understand then what is international law? You understood what is international law. I spoke about diplomats. I spoke about what is diplomacy. And I said that they are interconnected. Now, yet another thing I want you to know, the father of diplomacy. This, there are some things which may not be in the slide. You can write it down. The father of diplomacy. Who is the father of diplomacy? The father of diplomacy is, I'm going to put it in the chat. Leopold won rank. By his name, you would understand that he is a German. By his name, I'm sure you would know that he is a German. So there was this German philosopher who was, he was an historian as well. And he's regarded as, you know, the father of diplomacy. He is the father of diplomacy. Okay, so you can just write it down. So diplomacy is one of, you know, the pillars of international law. It is a very important pillar. It is kind of inviolable. That means it cannot be violated. There are certain rules with respect to diplomacy law or diplomatic law. It cannot be violated. And it is one of the basic pillars of international law. So having thus set the perspective, now let us go through the slides. Okay. Before we move further, okay, before we move further, a gentle reminder about you attending the class. Attendance is compulsory. This is for those who are entering the class. The second point is don't enter the class beyond 5.30. I told you 5.15, you have to get, I, I mean, your time, of course, my time is 5.30, but your time, I guess you are at four there. You're one hour, I mean, I'm one hour ahead of you. So uh, for you, it would be there 4.48 now. So the reason why I told you come at around 5.15 or 5.20, 5.15 to 5.30 is, a, uh, sorry, 4.15 to 4.30 is a buffering time for you. So you have to be here by that time. Then 4.30 sharp, we're going to begin with the class or even 4.35 probably if I want to give an opportunity for other for students to join in. And then we will begin with the class. Just today being the first class, I will keep admitting students, but after this, no. You'll have to just manage your way through with the help of recording. Because you know it is a distraction and I have to keep admitting the students. I am talking one side, I'm paying attention to you and you know I have to keep admitting the students. So this will not happen for the next class. 
So they being the first class, it's fine. Okay, let's get back to this. International law and diplomacy chapter one. What is international law? You already I already told you and you already know that. So there is this person, Jeremy Bentham. I'm sure you know him as well and you probably have studied about him in some other subject because you're already international law students. So everyone, whoever is international law students are normally law students know who Jeremy Bentham is. Jeremy Bentham was an English philosopher, jurist, and a social reformer. He was a founder of modern utilitarianism, or, you know, he is the one who, who really propagated utilitarianism, and um, he defined international law in, in a very simple words. He said that it is a collection of rules governing relation between states. States means countries. So what did he say? It is a collection of rules governing relations between states. And the legal dictionary defines international law as a collection of laws that are accepted as governing the relations between the states. Now, international law refers to the collection of laws that are accepted between countries as the laws that will govern the activities that they engage in with one another. International laws are established to deal strictly with issues that would concern countries as a whole, rather than focusing on the rights of an individual citizen that live in those countries. So this is what legal dictionary defines international law as, and they moved forward and they gave a little bit exhaustive or explanatory definition. In case we get disconnected, please join back. I'm repeating, in case we get disconnected, please join back. And this is the trend for all the classes. In case we get disconnected, please join back. Now, international law can be bifurcated you know, into two. One is use gentium, and two is use inter jantis. Use gentium and use inter Jontes. What is jus gentium? Jus gentium simply means law of nations. Now, jus gentium has its roots in ancient Roman law and Western laws. And the major portion of the law of nations, in simple words, that is jus Jantium, it's it simply means law of nations. And the major portion of this law is customary law. That means the, you know, it has got its base or it is its source in the customary law, which is practiced by people or nations. And jantis means people or nations in accordance with accepted principles of international conduct. Next is use inter jantis. It simply means law between people. People means jante and jantes means peoples. So that means the law between people. Use inter jantes simply means law between people. Use is law. So it is a body of law that comprises of treaties, United Nation conventions, and other international agreements. This is one kind of a classification that we could give you are saying that international law basically comprises of use jantium and use interjantis. That is, it is, you know, an amalgamation or as a whole, it consists of the law of nations as well as law between the people. So that is international law. So international law can be broadly classified again further into four public international law or the law of nations, private international law, international criminal law, as well as supranational law. Now, what is public international law? Public international law is nothing but the definition which Addo gave. He spoke about relationship between countries. He just spoke about relationship between countries, that's all. What Addo said, he said that is certain rules which govern nations. So the definition practically he gave me about was public international law. So public international law or 
It's also called as a law of nations. It is concerned exclusively with the rights and obligations of sovereign states. It is a body of customary or conventional rules which are considered legally binding by civilized states in their dealings with each other. Therefore, public international law governs it, the intercourse and relationship between countries with each other. It involves regular state practices that rely on opinion juris, internationally accepted behavior, and legal codes that are extracted from treaties and conventions. So by and large, public international law basically deals with the relationship between two different countries or two or more countries. It is basically the relationship or the interaction. It governs the interaction, the intercourse the relationship between countries altogether. And what is private international law? So private international law, you know, contrast, it's a, it's a contrast of public international law. So on the other hand, private international law is a set of rules or laws that govern the relationship between individuals, not here, individuals who, who engage in international or cross-border transactions. I'm repeating. What was public international law? We said it is a relationship, it is laws that govern the relationship between countries or nations. What is private international law? It is a law that governs the relationship between individuals here, individuals who engage in international or cross-border transactions. Are you understanding me? Public international law is or a set of rules that govern the relationship between nations, one country with another country or two different countries. It's a relationship between countries. But private international law is a relationship between country or countries and individuals. So in public international, it is only about countries. In private international law, it's about individual and countries. So this is the difference. So thus it governs private conflicts rather than conflicts between countries. There is a set rule of conduct that is followed and it works on the principle of jurisdiction. Oh thus God. conflicts, just mute your mic please. There is a set rule of conduct that is followed and it works on the principle of jurisdiction. Thus conflicts are adjudicated based on territorial jurisdiction. That means conflicts are resolved, conflicts are adjudicated. That is when the matters come up before the court, conflicts are resolved based on the territorial jurisdiction. That is which country they belong to, the prevalent laws, that is whatever laws that is there in that particular jurisdiction or that particular country, understanding if any between the two jurisdictions, if there is any other agreement that is there between the two countries and so on. For example, what is the example of private international? So when will private international law be used? For example, say, uh, let me give your example. Say Ado has a business in Somalia and he wants to, um, you know, or rather I would put it this way, Ado has a business, a running business in Somalia. He has purchased some goods for his business from say, any other country, say France, he has taken some goods from France. And then there is a problem between his company and a com another company which is there in France. So to determine the dispute between the company, Ado's company in Somalia and the French company in France. So the law that will be used there, the territorial laws and the conflict to resolve that conflict according in accordance with the agreement that is there between Edo's company and that French company and the laws which are there in France and the laws that are there in Somalia, the rights, you know, whatever is there in the agreement also would be checked. And what is the general principle, that international general principle, which is there would be checked and then the conflict would be resolved. Are you understanding me? So this is private international law. So the example that I gave you comes within the ambit of private international law. So private international law, it regulates relationship between individuals and countries or, you know, uh, or the laws which are prevalent in some other part of the world. And, you know, probably there are private individuals who 
contract with some other individuals who are residing on the on the other part of the in the other part of the world. So that's where you know private international law is used. So that, therefore, public international law is distinct from private international law. Next is international criminal law. What is international criminal law? Again, it is a global law. It is a part of public international law and crimes such as war crimes, genocide, and likewise fall within the ambit of international crimes and thereby the International Criminal Court, that is the ICC, has jurisdiction over such matters. So it's part of in public international law. Examples of, uh, you know, international crimes. For example, war crimes. What are war crimes? There are certain rules of war. There are certain rules to be complied with. Like there are certain conventions, international conventions with respect to war that has to be complied with, like Geneva Convention and so on. So likewise, there are certain rules that has to be complied. Like for example, now you must be following the news and you already know about Russia and Ukraine. And I won't go into the details of that, but of course you're following the news and you know there are certain allegations as well against Russia that it has not complied with you know, the international law part of it, the mandate under international law when it comes to war. And thereby, there is already a case that is filed against Russia that is, you know, saying that they have trespassed or they have, uh, you know, they have not followed the law there. So such kind of matters come within the ambit of international criminal law. War crimes, 